uh, how, how many, let me ask you first off, when, think of a time when you were disobedient, whether to your parents, to a teacher at school, um, to s just somebody in authority over you, um, how did that work out for you? <laughs> not, not good, Patrick, not, not good. Um, yeah, I mean, we all have that tendency, right? I mean, even when we're younger and even now as we're older, uh, you're not as old as I am, obviously, but we all have that tendency to uh, have a little bit of a disobedient um, streak in us, right? Because we don't want people telling us what to do. We want, want, we want to be our own boss, and, and the truth is we're never really our own boss. We, you know, we, um, but uh, when, I've I got to be honest with you, I wasn't really that much of a disobedient child. Now, I, I was no saint. I'm not trying to say that I didn't do anything wrong. I did plenty wrong. But um, my, my dad, I've told you before, my dad was old school, uh, and uh, he was never abusive. Um, but um, you just didn't cross him. I mean, I was, too, I was too afraid. The consequences just didn't, you know, they, they scared me. So the consequences scared me with my dad. Uh, and now if you saw my dad today, you would think, really? Now, uh, he's 86, okay, so cause, come on. So he's, he's, he's getting a little feeble, you know, he's, he, he can't do what he used to could do and all of that. And, but um, I'm telling you, if you'd have seen him when I was younger, when he was in his prime, you, I, you just wouldn't cross him. You just didn't cross him. Just, you, you didn't do that. So his consequences are too great. So, um, so we're going to look tonight at what are, when we are disobedient, which we tend to be, maybe some more than others, uh, that's for you to tell, not me, not me. but um, sometimes they're, they're, it always exposes something about us. In other words, um, you know, I know we have some school teachers here, my wife is a school teacher, a, a principal, um, assistant principal at a school, and she's been in, in education for over, over 20 years, and, and I taught school actually for a little while, um, believe it or not. And, um, but when, when there are children that in school that are like, their behavior is, is just, you know, poor, right? It's just not good. When they get in trouble, there's usually an underlying issue, right? Actually, right? I mean, there's usually something else that's causing that behavior, right? I mean, it's not whatever they, they've done, uh, whatever poor choice they've made, it's usually, and now I'm not excusing that, but I'm just saying it's usually because of something else that's going on in their lives, more often than not. It, so it's the same way with us. Our disobedience, especially our disobedience towards God, there, there's usually something underlying that th is at play there, okay? Does it make sense? So, so we're going to look tonight at, um, as we're walking through the Minor Prophets, we're going to look tonight at the disobedient prophet and you know him as Jonah. Now, this is probably the most difficult one to do, not because there's little known about Jonah, but because there's so much that we do know about this story, right? I mean, this is the, this is the most famous of all minor prophets, I'm sure. Um, if I may think of it, yeah, this would be the, probably the most, I mean, if you've been to vacation Bible school at all, you know the story of Jonah, right? If you've been to anything children ministry related, you know the story of Jonah. And um, so, so uh, the, the difficulty here tonight is trying to find something not, that's not there, not, not trying to add something to Scripture because I don't want to do that, but trying to find something that we can, a way that we can look at Jonah from a different perspective maybe. And by the way, our small group on Monday nights have been studying Jonah, so that makes it even more difficult. So I don't want to say the same thing that we've, that we've been teaching on Monday nights. So um, anyway, so we've looked at these major messages through the minor prophets, right? That's what we've called this. And, and we looked at, uh, the first we looked at Hosea with the, you know, the God's relentless love towards us, his, his endless love towards us. He is, he's pursuing us, just like he told Hosea to pursue uh, his wife, Gomer, who had been unfaithful to him. We looked at Joel and how to deal with crisis, and we all will have crisis in our lives. You've had crisis in your life, and guess what? It's going to continue to happen, right? You're going to have trees that fall on your house, just ask Caleb. So, you know, you're just going to have crisis in your life, okay? And it's going to be even more, you know, more difficult than that, more, more serious than that. Not that that wasn't serious, but you're going to have lots of things that happen. Um, so then we looked at 
Amos, remember, he, he was the delusional. He, he talked about, he talked to the, he wasn't delusional, but he was prophesying against these people who were delusional. They thought they were serving God, but it was all, it was all empty. There was no, it was just on the surface, right? They were just doing it to look good. We, we sing a song t- sometimes about just kind of just going through the motions of, of, of worshiping and just going through the motions of serving God. And that's kind of what Amos was talking about. It was these people that were just, they had, they had begun to believe that their worship was true when really they were just being delusional. And then last week we looked at Obadiah, because that's the most famous, right, Obadiah. Nobody knows about anything about Obadiah. But we said that Obadiah, there's, there's dangers in being prideful, there were the pitfalls of, be, of pride. And, and Obadiah was, was prophesying to a group of people who had just become prideful. And man, we all have had that tendency. You know, that, that's something that we all need to check ourselves on quite often. Again, some probably more than others, but pride is there. Pride is one of those underlying, like I said, it's one of those underlying issues that usually sometimes surfaces in another way. It doesn't always look like pride when it surfaces, but it starts out as pride, right? It starts out as something else that is led into this pride. So, so um, it's, it's something else, but it starts out as pride. So tonight, Jonah is 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 this disobedient prophet. And I'm not going to go through the whole story. I'm going to kind of I'm not going to read the whole story because you know the story of Jonah. You know that Jonah was a prophet, and and he he was called by God to go to the Ninevites to to preach the word of God. And Jonah didn't want to do that because we don't want to do what we're told to do, right? We, we're disobedient. We don't like being told to do things. Um, I don't like being told to do things. I don't mind being asked to do things. I don't mind being, you know, somebody saying, hey, you may want to try that. I don't mind that at all, but I don't like being told to do things. I don't, uh, that's just an area of pride, I guess, for me. But so God tells me to go to Nineveh. The only problem is the people in Nineveh were, were ruthless and they were evil. And Jonah knew that and he didn't want to go there. He, he, he wanted nothing to do with going to Nineveh. So what does Jonah do? He flees from God, or at least he attempts to. He tries to run from God, and not only just run from God, but go in the complete opposite direction, like uh, clear across country in a total different direction than, than where Nineveh would be for him. So naturally, you know, Jonah doesn't want to go, so he tries to run, and that was a big mistake. You know that he gets on a boat, uh, the boat goes down, Jonah gets swallowed by this big fish, and you know, he's in there for a couple of days hanging out. I don't know what he's doing, but he's, he's hanging out in, the, in there and t- you know, talking to God or whatever. And, and so, and then the well, basically, well, 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 we don't know if it's a whale, but it was a big fish, right? Um, uh, so we, we do know that. He basically vomits him out, okay? There's a, there's a visual for you. He spits him out onto the dry ground. And then Jonah goes and, and preaches the message that God had sent him to preach in the first place. But that's, that's really where the, where the story gets kind of interesting. Because he preaches this one message. And by the way, it's not a very good message. I mean, it's not a very positive message. There's no love in the message, really. Jonah just preaches, repent, or God's going to take you, he's going to take you out. I mean, you, all of you need to repent or you're going to die, basically is what he's saying. That's a paraphrase, but that's what Jonah says. But the amazing thing happens, though, in this terrible message that Jonah gives. He wasn't, it wasn't eloquent at all, not anything like what you get to hear every Sunday night. But so he, he teaches this one message and everybody repents. Everybody. Now, I'm not just saying like everybody, like, you know, your parents would say, well, if everybody told you to go off and jump off a bridge, would you do it? I'm not exaggerating. Everybody repents. Even, even the leaders, like the king, they all repent. And you think, man, that's great. Jonah didn't think it was great. Everybody repented, and Jonah got irate. He didn't like it. He, he got ticked off because everybody repented. He couldn't, and, and you're thinking, okay, Jonah, why what that doesn't make sense why would you be like that because you're doing what God has told you to do he goes they repent which would be man that would be like the greatest sermon ever I'd love to preach a sermon and everybody repent of all their sins so tonight you're going to repent of all your sins no I'm just but you know what I'd love to you know that that would as a preacher that's what you want to see right you want to see people respond not to what you say but to what God is saying to them through you that's what you want and Jonah gets to see that, but he, then he, he gets mad. So there's nothing new about this story, but so 
what we're going to look at is the dangers of being disobedient. And it really starts off early on. Uh, there's a couple things that we know. This is not the text I'm going to teach from tonight, so you don't have to, I mean, you can go to Jonah, that's fine. But Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 say this. This Again, I'm going to teach from chapter 4, but uh, chapter 1, 1 through 3 says this. I don't know if I gave that to you or not, but yeah, did I? Yeah, okay, it's there. Oh, yeah, sorry. That, it's all right. So there it is. Uh, it says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of him, saying, Amittai, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, meaning that it was a large city, 120,000 people, something like that, large city, a great city, and call out against it, for the evil has come up, for their evil has come up before me. Verse 3, but Jonah rose to flee from, to Tarshish, which again, is, if you know anything about uh, the, the geographical, which I don't really know much, but it's the opposite direction. It, it's like, it's not going in the right way. He's not even going close. From, from the presence of the Lord, he tries to flee from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down in, into it and uh, to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. So we see right away two things right off from Jonah. Number one, no, these, are, these are not part of the, the points tonight. They're, these are two extra ones, so they don't, count you, they don't cost you any more. They're just two extra points tonight. But number one, we see disobedience causes us, oftentimes, may cause us to miss out on the mission of God, what God has for you. When, when we are disobedient, and, and Jonah wanted nothing to do with going to Nineveh. I, I've told you before, mission trips are not my favorite thing to do. We, we need to do them. We need to go. I love going to Wales. That, that's kind of, you know, that's, that's, there's nothing really hard about that. I mean, other than the long plane ride. There's, Wales is a beautiful country, and I go, usually I go once every other year or sometimes every year. Um, obviously, COVID has kind of restricted that a little bit, but we're going to go again uh, someday, uh, again, because I've just got, you know, we've got a relationship there and a ministry there. But, but some of the other ones, like, you know, going to these third world countries, that's not, that's not, that's not easy for me. That's hard for me because I like the comfort of like first world comforts, right? You know, I like, I like showering uh, and, you know, clean, warm water. Um, I like sleeping on a bed, you know, that, uh, so, I mean, there's just, there's things that I, that I like that it just, but it's not always about me. It's not always about us. So we see that sometimes even things we don't want to do, Jonah didn't want to do this, but if he wouldn't have, and if he, and as he tried not to, sometimes when we are disobedient and we try to flee from God, we will miss out on the God, on the mission that God has for us. We're going to miss out. I, I've, I've been to places, like I said, I didn't really want to go there and, and it struggled to be there. But after that trip, I was so excited to get home. I was so excited to get back and get away from those places, not the people, but the places that were just so, man, just, you know, just, uh, just horrible conditions you know, in Mexico or Honduras or even Brazil, I went to some of these, it's uh, just, just horrific uh, situations and circumstances, but looking back, man, I have such great memories, and God did some great things, not because I went, but I just got to see God do some great things in people's lives, not just the people that we were there ministering to, the people that, the people that went with us, I saw them grow so much in their relationship with the Lord. Most of them were students, you know, because I did student ministry for so long. So, so one thing we know, disobedience will cause us to miss out on the mission of God. And secondly, disobedience causes us to run and hide. When, when you were little and you did something wrong, what, did you, what was your first thought? I better go run and tell my dad and mom? Not me. I wanted to hide. I wanted to go, like, they couldn't find me, right? Like, they wouldn't find out if, you know, I wanted to go run and hide. I wanted to hide it because I was embarrassed or, or because I'm just, I was scared of what was going to happen. Mostly, I was just embarrassed about what I did. So I want to hide. I want to run and hide. We see that from Jonah. Jonah, he, he, he was, gonna, he was got, going to miss out on this mission that God had called him to, and he, was, and he was causing him to run and hide. Disobedience exposes this about us. It exposes these areas. Where there, there's, there's three things specifically in chapter 4 we're going to look at that disobedience exposes in our lives. So if you look with me in Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, 
This is after he goes to Nineveh and after he preaches and after all the people repented. The last verse in chapter 3, which is not on your screen, it'll not be on the screen, but he says, God relented the of the disaster that he had said he would do to them and he, did, and he did not do it. So God relented. And then Jonah got irate. I mean, he just went off the chain, right? So, so in chapter 4, here we go. So God relented, and, but chapter 4 says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Look at that. Exceedingly means like that's not a little bit, right? I mean, he, he was a completely unhappy and angry. He was, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That, that is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful. He's angry at God for being graceful and, uh, gracious and merciful. Basically, um, I knew you were gracious, God. I knew you were going to do this. He's slow to anger, you're slow, and, and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore, now, O oh Lord, please just take my life from me. Can you can you imagine? He's so he's so angry. He's so depressed. He th thinks it's just easiest just take take me away. You know, just take my life from me. Just kill me right here. Kill me now. I don't I don't want I don't want to live anymore. And he says, um, just take my life for me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? In other words, what do you, why are you angry? What is it, what is it, how is it, how is it, it doing you good to be angry at this? Verse 5, Jonah went out to the city and sat down. So he gets angry and now he goes and pouts, Okay. And Jonah went out to the city and sat down on the east side of the, of the city, at the east of the city, and, and made a booth for himself there. And he sat under the it for shade till it should not, till he should not see what would become of the city. Now the Lord appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from the discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when drawn, uh, when dawn came up the next day God appointed a worm that attached to the plant so that it withered when the sun when the sun rose God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and he asked again that he might, might die and said it is better for me to die than to live all right let me pray for you real quick father thank you so much for your word Lord I pray that tonight through this very familiar story we can just figure out something we can Here's something from you that is fresh and new to our lives. And Lord, when we are tempted to, um, to be disobedient, we're tempted to, to just not want to do what you are calling us to do because it's hard. Father, I pray that you would just open our eyes and ears tonight to, that we would have a better understanding of, of what disobedience can bring about in our lives. Lord, speak to us tonight. Father, we are your servants. Just like Samuel prayed, we're your servants. We want to hear from you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. So the first thing we see, disobedience, the danger of disobedience is it, it exposes our bitterness. Did you see in verse 1 through 3, he says, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He, he, was, he, was just, he was ticked off and he became bitter. He became bitter of the, these people who were ruthless people who didn't deserve God's mercy, which by the way, newsflash, neither do you and I. But they didn't deserve it. And Jonah knew that. And Jonah said, God, if you, I mean, he's basically saying, if you send me, I know you're going to be merciful to them. And that's, and he's saying, you see, this is why I didn't want to go because I knew you were going to be merciful to these people and gracious to these people. And Jonah is just ticked off. How many of you growing up had to go to um, uh, somewhere with your family, like to visit other family that you never wanted to go see? You know, like the aunt that had needed to shave, right? You know, I mean, they always had the little hairs or whatever. I don't know. He, he, or the grandma, you know, and it, whatever. We all had that, right? We all had those, those family that we don't, didn't really want to claim as family or whatever. Um, we always had those things, those things that we didn't really want to do. We didn't want to go, but we, we went anyway because we had to go. And sometimes we just got a little bitter, because of that look what hebrews the writer of hebrews says hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 and 15 says this strive for peace with everyone even your um grandma need to shave 
Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it, it may become defiled. You see, bitterness springs up. If we're not careful, it'll spring up inside of us. Disobedience can cause us to become bitter, and bitterness doesn't lead us to anything good. When we become bitter, we just become so self-absorbed, and, and it's, it's, it's not easy to get away from bitterness. It's difficult to get away from bitterness. He says, look, obtain the grace of God that is no root of bitterness. You see, it becomes like a root, and, it, and, it, and bitterness can, like a root, can just start getting entangled in every area of your life if you're not careful. And bitterness does so much destruction. It can do so much destruction. Uh, man, I, I, growing up, you, you, you guys know this, but you have teachers or coaches or, or whatever, who, whomever, and, and you just don't, you don't like them very much, right? I mean, they're just not very nice. They're not, they seem like they always treat somebody else better than they treat you, and you're like, well, I didn't do anything to you, right? I mean, I, I didn't understand. What, what are you treating me this way for? Why are you not treating me as well as you're treating somebody else? And you just get bitter. I had some teachers in school, and, and I just, they didn't seem to like me for some reason. I don't know why, but I just got bitter. And it wasn't hurting them any. It was hurting me. I was bitter. They weren't bitter. I was bitter. And it caused me to, to keep from bitterness if, if we allow it to take root in our lives. It will, uh, we will, it'll keep us from showing the love of God to other people that desperately need to see it. They desperately need to see the love of God. And, and they need to see it in us, those of us that have a relationship with Christ. That's what we're called to do. We're not called to just love those that, that you know, come to church and you know spend time with us and and love god also we're called to love everyone now we're not called to to accept every lifestyle and all of that i'm not saying that i'm not saying we lower our convictions but we are called to love them and by doing so showing them love of god revealing our convictions to them in a loving way but bitterness can keep us from doing that if we're not careful, Jonah, his disobedience was exp exposed the, the bitterness that he had in his heart toward these people who, who were ruthless by all accounts, were wicked people, but they needed God. They needed the love of Christ and they repented. They repented. But Jonah still was bitter toward them. Secondly, disobedience exposes our selfishness. How many of you think you're selfish? Okay, we have a few honest people in the room. Four. Uh, you know, selfishness is one of those things that it's, it's um, I guess all of these really are, but selfishness is one of those things It's a whole lot easier to see in somebody else than it is to see in ourselves, isn't it? I mean, sometimes, I mean, I know I'm a selfish person. I, I know that. I get that. But um, you don't have to tell me. I, I know that. But, so, but we can see that so much quicker. I, I, man, I can spot that in other people like that and I, I can't snap my left there you go I can't snap my left hand evidently but I can see it right away in some people right in myself I don't always see it but it's there and and when we are disobedient it exposes that selfishness look what he says in verses three through five he says therefore now O Lord please take my life he's selfish he said, just 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 take my life from me I don't even want to be here anymore just take my life just, and, and by the way, he's not, it's not, he's not praying, God, take, take me away. He's, he's saying, Lord, just kill me here because I don't even want to live. He's being selfish about this. God, he wanted God to take him out. He's like, that would be, be better. That would be easier. And then he goes down and he just pouts. He sits down and he pouts. He just had a little pity party because he's selfish. And, and I'm being hard on Jonah because every one of us had that same tendency if we're not careful. 
I know I'm being hard on him, but he's just the one that we're talking about. He's got the book named after him, right? So you and I don't have a book named after us, but so in the Bible anyways. So he's, he, we know that he just, he's exposes our, our selfishness. Look what Paul says to the Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. How are you doing with that one? Like, we all do okay with it from sometimes, but like all the time. I don't do so well with that one. Verse 4, let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Can I be really honest with you? There's, there's three or four people that I do really good with this, and that's about it. I look to the interest of about three or four others people before my own and that's about it that, that's that's um, that's harsh for me to even say that to to confess that but it's true I mean I, I look I think I look to the interest of my family more than I do my own but that's about it I mean, I have my moments when, you know, I want other people to prosper and I want other people to ha have things good happen in their lives. But listen, I can't say that that happens on a daily basis. I can't say that I always am looking out for the interest of other people more than I'm looking out for mine, my own interest. Our, our culture teaches us that, right? Look out for yourself. And, and, and you know, some, in some ways that we have to. We have to look out for ourselves. I get that. But according to Scripture, according to what Paul writes, if we, don't, if we look out for our own interests as opposed to other people, then we're being selfish. Paul writes to the Romans, but for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. It's not good in the end <laughs> if all we do is look out for the, our own good and not the good of others. Do, do you really, do you genuinely care about what other people and their and that you know, maybe people that you see on the street? How many of you are like me that you see the people, the, the people on the street? Maybe they're begging, maybe they're they're sitting, and and I am quick to judge, man. I I am, you know, there's somebody sitting across the street, like over from Walmart or whatever, and they're sitting with a sign and they're smoking a cigarette and they're needing money. And I'm quick to judge. I'll just be honest with you. I'm, I'm like, you can buy that cigarette, but you need money from me. Now, there's truth in that statement, sure, but there's also a whole lot of judgment. And I'm not saying it's safe for us to do. I'm not, you know, saying that we need to just give out everything to anybody. And I, I'm not saying that's wise either. Okay. But I'm saying, do we really care about the needs of other people? Or are we just so consumed with our own like Jonah was? He didn't want to go there because they weren't nice people. They weren't good people. He wanted nothing to do with it. Are we really so different? Honestly, I, I, I'm, I'm not so different all the time. I struggle with that. Because there are people that I don't really want to share my faith with. I mean, not, not a group of people. I'm not saying like a, a you know, a, a, a class of people. I'm not saying that, but there's just certain individuals that I come in contact with, not all the time, but I come in contact with occasionally, and I think, man, I don't, I don't want to share my faith with that person. I don't want to be gracious to that person. But you see, guys, that's not up to us. God has commanded us to be gracious, show mercy walk humbly that's what we're supposed to do and that's if we don't do that we are showing that we are exposing our own selfishness jonah had no intention of loving these people the people that god had specifically called him to go and show love to or preach to he had no intention of doing it he had every intention of being disobedient and disobedient calls him to be selfish so then the last thing disobedience exposes our cowardice, or basically it, it exposes how coward, how cowardly we are. Here's what I mean. Look at verse 8. It says, 
Um, and he asked that, this is the end of verse 7, that it would be better to live than, uh, this is verse 8. He says, and, and he asked God that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. That, that is, that's selfish, like we just talked about, but that's also a coward's way out, right? How, how cowardly do you have to be to just, you know what, I just, I don't want to die. And listen, this is not the first instance of that. We, uh, Jonah uh, says that in chapter 1, he, when, he, when the boat is being rocked a little bit, and I never really real thought about it this way until we were doing our small group, and uh, Eric Mason, who, who is teaching it online, the, the small group about Jonah, he said that, and I never thought about it, I never put it this way, but when Jonah, the, the, you know, the, the waters got just crazy and the, they thought the boat was going down, they started unloading things from the ship, you know, to get, it, to get the heavy the weight off of the ship. And Jonah says, it's, it's my fault that it's happening, throw me over. I just thought, you know, that's kind of the end of it. No, Eric Mason brought out, I love this point, he brought out, Jonah wasn't even man enough to throw himself, he didn't need anybody to throw himself over, he could have just jumped over. But he wanted other people to throw him over because he was a coward. He knew he was the reason. He knew that God was causing this to happen because he was in the boat. But instead of manning up and jumping over and saving everybody else, he just was a coward. And he wanted to coward way out and say, hey, guys, throw me over. Now, I don't know anything about that ship. I don't know how big it was or anything, but I bet it wasn't really hard for him to just jump over the boat. And here he does the same thing. He wants God, he doesn't want to end his own life. He wants God to do it for him. Because in his mind, that's easier. And I'm not saying there's anything cowardly about killing, or uncowardly about killing yourself. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying, listen, he feels like this is the only way to fix this problem or this that's going on in his life. And, and he, he wants God to just take him out. He, it's easier if he didn't even exist any longer. That's what he's feeling. Guys, that's a coward's way out. Not wanting to face the consequences, not wanting to face the difficulties of life. Listen, I know life it gets difficult. I get that. I understand that. I understand I I've, I've haven't suffered like drastic depression, but I know that depression really exists. I have seen depression. I've, I've, I've had a touch of it at times, but I've seen that. I know that that's real, and your mind plays tricks on you when you're deep into depression. And I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. I don't, I don't pretend to, you know, be, to know any of those answers, but I know that when you are deep in depression, sometimes your mind just causes you to think things that just don't make, they don't make any sense. You don't, you don't think rationally at all because you're just so depressed. And in, and in his mind, he thought, that's the easiest way if I just no longer hear but that's given into your fears. Paul writes to Timothy that God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but he gives us a spirit of power, of, of love, and self-control. We just sang about the fear. Don't, we don't get need to give into fear. You know why? Because Jesus will be there with us wherever we go. He will walk through that fire with us. I love that song. We, the, he will always be in the fire with us. No matter what that fire is, no matter what you're walking through right now, no matter what you have walked through, what you will walk through, I know it's difficult. I understand that, and I know that I have no idea how difficult it is because I'm not the one walking through it. You are. But I, I know from the bottom of my heart that Jesus will walk through the difficulty with you. He may not. I can't promise you he will take it away because I don't know that. He didn't take it away from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They had to walk through the fire, but he walked through it with them, and he did with Jonah as well, and Jonah really didn't even deserve it. Look at Proverbs 29, verse 25, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. We don't need to give in to fear, and this is, this is real for me because I, I give in to fear all the time. I, I don't share my faith most of the time because of fear. And, and you know what? I don't even know if it's fear that I want to be liked by the person I'm trying to share my faith with. I don't know what it is. I just, I don't want to be rejected. I hate being told no. Sometimes I hate saying the word no. I know that's not good. You need to say the word no sometimes. 
just not when I ask you to do something. Um, but, but right, we, we, I don't know what it is, but we, I just don't like to be rejected. There's a fear there, and it's, but it's not there by God. It, it, he says it lays a snare. It's, it's like a trap for us, and it keeps us in our own little spot because we are safe in that spot, and we won't step out of it. It's like a snare. It keeps us trapped. That's what fear does in our lives. We can't let fear rule our lives. If we do, we will never experience the fullness of God, His love and His mercy and His grace. We will never experience that. And Jonah was on the verge of never experiencing that because he was disobedient and he gave in to his fear. He didn't want to go see those people because he knew God was gracious. And he didn't like those people. And he didn't want God to, re- to forgive them and relent, but God did. And then the last verse, Revelation 21, I love this. This speaks of cowardly, but for as for the cowardly, the, fel- the faithless, the detestable, for the, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Well, he didn't really miss any punches there, does he? He just goes right to it. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. You see, when we, when we give in, we cower to our fears. We become like cowards. And listen, God didn't give us a spirit of fear to be a coward and to not do the things that he calls us to do just because they're hard. Listen, life is hard. So what? It's hard. It just is. And you either deal with it and you move on or you just give up. You see, Jonah was giving up. He, he didn't want to go. He was being disobedient to God. I think really that's one of the things that, that kind of grabs me about this story is his disobedience. Maybe it was out of just fear because he didn't want to see God do these great things. He didn't want to go where God wanted him to go because it wasn't a very nice location. And by the way, sometimes the location that God sends you is not not going to be a great location right he may send you to places that are way out of your comfort zone matter of fact he probably will because that's just how he works are you willing to do that are you willing to go to places you don't really you don't want to go because god is telling you to we have to be I'm not saying you have to like it. I don't think he ever calls us to, that we, that is a prerequisite for his calling in our lives. But we still have to go. So let me ask you these questions as we close. What has disobedience in your past? What has disobedience exposed in your life? Has it exposed some bitterness? Has it exposed the selfish nature, selfish heart? Has it exposed that you give in to fear too much and sometimes we just act like we're cowards? Listen, it it could be a whole, and it may be even something that we didn't even mention tonight. Maybe it's exposed something totally different in you. I know for me at different times, my disobedience towards God has, has really exposed some just, just some deep down anger that I've had that I didn't even really remember that I had towards people. It's exposed that in me. And, and the, the, the scary part about that the scary may be too strong of a term, but, but the scary thing about that is when it surfaces, and it will surface, the people that see that are usually not the ones that caused that anger in the first place. Does that make sense? It may be from something years and years ago that you've kind of buried deep, but it, it's been exposed now, and you're around different people, and the people that will see that are the people you spend the most time with, your family, your, your closest friends, and and they they 
get the result of that when they had nothing to do with it? What has this obedience exposed in your life? And the last question, or not really question, but how we respond. I want you to say, you know what? I, I will do whatever it takes. I'm going to be obedient to God's call, no matter what. Now listen to me. Don't, don't say that unless you mean it. Because this part right here, no matter what, that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. That, that can be where it really gets scary. Because as I said earlier, God will call you out of your comfort zone and he will take you to places that people that you, you, you just don't like. Just like he did Jonah. Jonah didn't just dis dislike the Ninevites. He hated them. He despised them. And there was probably good reason for it. But God sent him anyways. Are you willing to do that? If you're not willing to do that, don't, don't, make, don't say this to yourself. I'll be obedient to God's call no matter what. Because it's kind of like what we said before. Be careful what you pray for. Because you just might get it. Be careful what you wish for. Because you ju he just might send you there. Because that is God. That's how he works. What has God called you to do? And how has it exposed certain things in your life? Some local mission work here. Um, I need about, I don't know, I mean, uh, anybody can do it. Anybody wants to. We're going to help clean up over at the Boys and Girls Club here in Columbia. It's on Wayne Street. So I'll give you more details. Just, just know that's coming May 1st. It's Saturday. It'll be just a couple hours in the morning. It's just cleaning up around the area. Um, we are ready for some activities outside since um, COVID is not gone, but it's, it's getting away. So we're going to Top Golf uh, again on May 22nd, which is Saturday evening. Um, so you'll hear more about that May 22nd, Top Golf. Don't forget, uh, we'll have a couple bays there, all the food and all that stuff. Uh, small group tomorrow night in here at 6.30. And then we have guide time at 7 in the morning. If you're brave enough to get up 7 in the morning and be here with us, we'll just be a few minutes in the Word and in prayer that day. Let me pray this over you before you leave. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and may He be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. That is our prayer for you. Go in peace. Thank you so much. Have a good night.